Um, but I've been asked by Sandra to give a little bit of an overview of uh, an organization that I helped found and, and now chair, which is called Gap Filler in Christchurch. And I, I must admit, I've been, as many people in Christchurch, so kind of navel gazing and uh, self absorbed lately with our own little problems that I don't, I don't really have a good sense. And can I just ask how many of you are, are at all familiar with? The Gap Filler Initiative in Christchurch? <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, so so we, we began as, as an organization uh, actually after the September quake, September 2010. And, and we were facing a lot of this. This photo was actually taken in October 2010. Uh, and, and what we had were lots of spaces where buildings had been demolished. This was actually the site of my favorite Mexican restaurant. And, and you had a lot of people, landowners, property owners, who were tied up in insurance battles and EQC struggles. And you had sites like this that were fenced off uh, and, and out of bounds. And I guess that's something that we, we wanted to challenge. I, I really didn't like that idea that the red tape the bureaucracy uh, and or just the workings of private capital that give property owners certain certain rights would permit this sort of situation citywide where we have lots of land um, lying vacant, fake, fenced off that no one can access. And so we actually approached the property owners and sought permission to, to uh, use their sites. And, and our very first project, we turned this site in, into... Uh, uh, a little fishy garden just scrounging whatever materials we could and we opened it to the general public and just made it a, a space where people could come and bring a picnic and we had um, musicians and whatnot and, and we put a call out just asking if there would be any bands they willing to pay. We couldn't uh, pay them anything but we're willing to play and contribute something to the recovery of the city and over the course of a two week period where we occupied this site we had something like 41 bands play and various puppetry performers and poetry readings and circus arts and all sorts of people just um, bubbled up from the community. People who, who otherwise I guess didn't have uh, an official role in the rebuild or the recovery of the city but who wanted to offer something. And so I, I guess we didn't realize what we'd started and, and sorry this is... This reach live music, we had some puppetry performances, and we had, uh, surprisingly, big crowds turn out, day and night. Um, and so we decided to carry on, and we made, I, I guess, a, a decision that disappointed quite a lot of people when we undertook our second project, which was to do something entirely different, because the whole kind of music community and performing arts community um, wanted us to do more of the same. Um, but we did a second project, which was just a, uh, a poster display on the wall of a bare site that had been exposed. And, and these were actually before after images. I'm sorry if you can't see them very well. But this was actually images taken in Berlin uh, just after the Berlin Wall came down. And then the photographer went back 10 years later to the exact same spot and took another photograph so you could compare the either heritage uh, reconstruction or demolition or whatever. So it was a bit of a provocation. I guess to the city of Christchurch and, and how much they valued or not um, the, the heritage. Um, after the February earthquake, the situation was considerably different. Uh, we weren't quite as upbeat and actually didn't know whether we should carry on at all. And, and most of our most of our organization was kind of mobilized through social media and so we put a call out through Facebook and others and asked people, you know, is there any place for this anymore? Do you want us to carry on? And we got a resounding yes. And in particular because uh, all of the cinemas in Christchurch, in Central City anyway, were um, badly damaged and subsequently demolished. Um, we, we got asked to run some, some cinema projects. So we went out into the suburbs and we occupied another vacant site. And, and did a few bands in the evening and some late night film screenings projected right onto the bare wall that had been exposed by the demolition. Um, and, and I'll just very quickly run you through, through a couple of our other projects just to give a sense of the breadth of the project. Um, 
Uh, there was an improvised dance performance on that same side. Um, this is the now infamous book fridge, or what they call the book exchange. Um, this is quite silly. We just took an old commercial refrigerator and we placed it on a vacant site and put the park bench there and, and a path of pavers leading up to it. Um, and, and we put a call out to the community and asked people to contribute books that in some way it provoked them to think differently and change, change their way of thinking. Um, and we stuffed the fridge with books and we left them there uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and people can come and take a book, leave a book, uh, what have you. And, and at that opening event, we, we had a pretty good turnout. And a lot of people said, you know, so who's going to lock the fridge every night? <laughs> <laughs> or are you going to take all the books out and put them back in in the morning or something? And, <laughs> and, and actually, we, we, we got a bit nervous and wondered if it was just a stupid idea. But like all of our ideas, um, they're, they're social experiments of a sort. Uh, and we don't know how long they're going to last. And in fact, uh, you know, the book fridge has been knocked over once, the glass shattered, but by the time we even heard about it, someone from the community had been there, had picked it up, had replaced the glass with a perspex front that they had in their garage. And whatever. So it's just an, an amazing kind of community ex uh, social experiment. And I'm happy to say that it's still there. It lasted through the winter. And it's been about 15 months now. And and we go back and check on it, and I swear to you, every three or four days you go, and, and you won't recognize a single title in there, because it's actually getting used that much. So, um, just really exciting experiment. Um, in the port town of Littleton, uh, one of the very prominent sites there, I mean, they lost an awful lot of, um, basically, their whole main street. Uh, and, and so we managed to get a license on one of the prominent sites uh, along the main street there, and, and involved lots of community groups, and built what we call the Littleton Petonk Club. Um, so we made a we made a petonk pitch and just a, just generally another public space, public garden, um, as a group of volunteers, and just a, a, a community space. And and actually uh, about two months ago now, the city council actually purchased this site from the private landowners and have declared that they're going to make it the new town square of Littleton. So. Um, <laughs> And the interesting thing about that is, is that, I, mean, I don't know how well you can tell here, but we just created kind of the framework for a space. And what happens is every couple of weeks someone else comes along and contributes something of their own. Someone builds a sandbox and leaves a few toys for kids or, or you know, brings their own furniture or whatever. And, and it's just that wonderful space that people have embraced. And by and large, council parks aren't like that. You don't know anyone turn up at a council park and build a sandbox for their neighborhood. Um, and yet there's something about this site. We, we, we don't tell people, please build a sandbox, but, but something about the site invites them to do so in the same way that something about the council. So, so just an odd irony that city council are purchasing this site and retaining it as town square, and actually people are a little bit uneasy about that because they don't know if the council's notion of public will be as public in practice as, uh, as what our site has been. Um, we created, this was a site where um, the best vintage cycle shop in Christchurch used to be. And uh, this was kind of our first, uh, this was our first big project after we actually got a bit of funding and didn't have to fully scrounge. And so we commissioned a small team of engineers to develop a cycle powered cinema system. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we screened the whole range of cycle themed films on the side for uh, <laughs> An old cycle safety video from the National Film Year that trained up chimpanzees to ride bikes. Um, and it was really important for us that we didn't just have stationary bikes there, but actually people rode their own bicycles in and then locked them into these specially um, welded frames so that they were actually generating power using their own bikes. <laughs> Um, th this is a funny one that we did just about uh, six weeks ago or so, again in Littleton. 
um, a Brazilian architect approached us and he had this project where he'd done all the work himself designing and building this structure and he wanted to offer it to the public but, but he didn't kind of have a, a way to do so, a means to do so. So this is the basic structure, it's kind of um, based on a Native American architecture. This is the insulation. And there's a pot-bellied stove inside, and it's actually a sweat lodge, a, a sauna oh, of sorts. And obviously there are a few <laughs> insurance difficulties and other things <laughs> um, that we helped him through. Um, but that's what it looked like when it was all together, and we put it up on a corner site in Littleton, and for a weekend there we had a public sauna um, where anyone could come and, <laughs> and, and give it a try. That's... That's the main street of Littleton at midnight on a Sunday. <laughs> uh, on, on the far left here is the Brazilian architect, Fabricio Fernandez, and he said to me that night, he said, you know, there's all this talk of rebuilding the city, rebuild, rebuild, rebuilding is so boring, let's reimagine it. <laughs> and I think that's a really nice photo to kind of capture that. But, so I just want to capture some small sense of the the network of people that we've been able to engage, uh, taking an active role, in some ways very much against the top-down sort of master planning process that the government's undertaking at the moment. And, uh, you know, having been in one of the afternoon session just now um, about the government's education policy and such, I mean, that top-down uh, approach is mirrored certainly in the tertiary sector and all throughout our our society at the moment, and you don't need me to tell you that the you know, university shouldn't just be about job training and fueling the economy, and it seems at the moment there's no room for kind of pure research in the sciences, no room for disinterested academic inquiry, and, and certainly, uh, at least at my institution, it seems no need for the arts except as escapist entertainment for the engineers. Um, but I think it's important, uh, to me anyway, to remember that my profession, and I think all of our professions, is, is first and foremost as educators, and the kind of disciplinary affiliation or, or whatever role you have within that sector com comes second. And, and as educators, it really is important that we resist or oppose the sort of corporate logic that's being imposed on universities at the moment, because um, that really will be the death of the integrity of higher education, in my opinion. Um, but my, my specific discipline, theater and film studies, obviously um, was involved in terms of the content of some of our projects. Um, but, but I want to explain the kind of foundational discipline of theater and film studies is what we call performance studies, which is a discipline that uh, proposes that we're all performing roles all of the time. Um, and the spaces we inhabit, our environments, encourage or discourage certain selves from emerging or certain performances of self. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, just the way this space is organized right here. When you're sitting at round tables and you're forced to look at each other across the table and make eye contact, it encourages a different sort of behavior. And, unfortunately, um, your typical lecture theater, where students are certainly not encouraged to discuss anything, but they're all facing in one direction, uh, waiting to hear what the person up at the front of the room said. And uh, in Christchurch at the moment, we've got an awful lot of fences. And we've got a red zone, and we've got red stickers on buildings, and we've got prohibitions, and, and dead ends, and do not enters all over the place. Uh, and, and you end up with a very docile population who, who are facing these sort of changes every day, these sort of rules and regulations. But it, that, it's true to a lesser degree everywhere. I really feel like we're, we're a society that feels like we need permission to try anything a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, and so, I, I, I don't know, lately I've been saying this phrase over and over that, that the opposite of a permit is an invitation. And I guess my mission at the moment is to create as many invitations as possible um, to as many people as possible. And, and this is an example of what I mean by that. This is one of our projects that we launched in uh, March or April of this year. It's called the Dancer Mat. It's effectively just a dance floor and a jukebox. 
We converted an old laundromat into a jukebox. Oh. <laughs> and so it's got a little uh, headphone jack. You plug your iPod or iPhone or whatever um, media player into it, and you drop a $2 coin in, and, and the lights and sound come on for half an hour. So you can oh. play music. <laughs> This just gives you a bit of an idea of the context, what's surrounding it, not very much, although there's a major bus route going along there, which is quite exciting. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of dance companies and organizations occupy the top floors of cheap real estate in the central city. None of it exists anymore. So immediately we were amazed by how many people latched onto the dance mat and taught various dance classes or just had impromptu sort of nightclubs. <laughs> These are the Swingtown Rebels, another dance group. Uh, some other dance form called Zook or Zout, which I've never heard of, but their photos appeared on our Facebook page. Um, the Canterbury Ballet started teaching classes there. Wow. <laughs> and, and these people started turning up at 7 p.m. every night, calling themselves the Superhero Dance Squad. <laughs> range of very mundane superpowers. <laughs> um, but I guess that's what I mean really by an invitation, that um, playing a bit of music and having a dance is something, I mean, I could do it right now. I could turn my phone on, play a song, or, but we don't. You know, it could happen on any street corner at any time, but it doesn't. And so creating a little framework, all it is is a bare space and a jukebox, basically, but it's enough of an invitation. And, and this is one project that we've actually been able to track because we can count the $2 coins, and since its inception, it's been used for about six and a half hours a day. Oh, which is oh, oh, oh. Um, and the, the Life in Vacant Spaces initiative that um, was, was briefly mentioned uh, is it, just our extension of that concept. So what, what we've created is essentially a brokering entity that if someone has a good idea, like say that Brazilian architect, um, we've created this new entity that deals with all the insurance, all the council permits, uh, whatever sort of fire regulations you have to worry about, and all of that sort of thing. Brokers the agreement to borrow the land effectively from the private property owner, so that anyone out there who has a, a, a good idea that's in the public interest, we can just match them up with the space and, and let them get on with it, um, which is, Right. Um, sorry, I'll wrap it up. Uh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this afternoon session uh, about rethinking the role, I, I, I'm talking about the government's tertiary policy, and it's got me really fired up. Everyone was so unanimously opposed to kind of the management decisions happening at the universities and to the government policy, and. My main role with the Gap Filler Trust has been the governance. I'm the chairman of the trust board, and I just wanted to share with you very quickly, um, and I just kind of thought of this about half an hour ago, so bear with me, but there's three decisions that we made that I'm very proud of, and I want to share with you just very quickly. One, we decided very early on not to repeat ourselves. So every project we do, we set a threshold that has to be sufficiently different from all the previous projects we've done. And that is entirely against sort of corporate logic, which tells you, get good at one thing, do it over and over and over, and milk the most returns that you can from what kind of knowledge that you have. Um, and so we've taken an approach rather to encourage experimentation over and over and over, try something new, learn something new. Um, and I'm yeah, really pleased with that. Related to that, um, we set a policy that we don't want to acquire any strategic assets of an organization. So the cycle-powered cinema you saw, it takes an incredible lot of staff time and energy to run that, to set up a venue, to run that as a public cinema. Um, and we wanted to move on to the next project, so we decided just to gift that to another organization with a caveat that they keep it going in the public domain. And so that's a policy that we've established that whenever we have, so the dance on that after it ends its kind of uh, uh, run in the next couple months, we'll gift that to, uh, to an organization.
organization in Christchurch to keep that going. And, and just lastly, we've decided to open source all of our materials, so the sort of legal agreements with property owners that we've had to pay for, all of the insurance advice, everything else that we've gone through, either figuring out or, or paying for, we're just making it all open and available on our website so that anyone who wants to do a similar sort of project doesn't have to come to us to do it, but in theory, and can just go off and do it on their own. And I think the, the reason I wanted to share that is just because I think there is a way that the management of an organization can have a very positive impact on the culture of that organization. And unfortunately, we're not seeing it very much in the tertiary sector um, at present. And I just want to say what a joy and privilege it's been to be part of an organization and a group where it's much, much, much easier to have integrity as a part of that group than it is as an individual. And, and I think that's what organizations could be, should be, that, that they're better than any of the particular individuals within them. And that's certainly my hope for my university, University of Canterbury, for our tertiary sector. And I'm getting a little inkling that it might be true of this organization, the TEU. So thank you very much.